This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. This episode of Software Engineering Radio is sponsored by Hired.com. Hired works with more than 4,000 companies from startups to large public enterprises, including Facebook, Uber, GitHub, and Stripe, and 13 major tech hubs in North America and Europe. It's totally free for candidates looking for full-time and contract opportunities, including iOS developer jobs. With one application, you get an average of five offers on the platform, listing salary and equity up front before you interview, so you don't waste time interviewing for jobs you might not want. SE Radio listeners get double the $1,000 bonus just for signing up on the show's link at Hired.com slash SE Radio. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. Today, I'm here with Cody Vellinger. Cody has been in the recruiting field for over 10 years and is the founder of Rocket Recruiting. Cody, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks, Robert. Very excited to be here. We are located here in the beautiful San Francisco offices of Rocket Recruiting, and I will be talking about Cody with recruiting and the labor market. I do have a disclosure for our listeners. I did submit a resume to someone at this firm several years ago uh, and was not placed at a job. So, Cody, would you like to tell the listeners anything else about your background? Sure. I'll I'll just expand slightly. So, as Robert, as you said, I've, I've been recruiting for 10 years. I cut my teeth recruiting in Tokyo for engineers for international companies there. After that, I worked for a firm here in San Francisco recruiting enterprise software consultants all across the U.S. And the last four and a half years at Rocket have been specifically focused on recruiting engineers for startups in the Silicon Valley market. I'd like to start out with a question of why do recruiters exist? In many types of transactions, a buyer and seller meet directly. You can think of other examples like uh, often selling a home, there's a broker. Why has the market created a niche for an intermediary in filling jobs? Sure. So just to quickly expand on the profile that I gave, as I mentioned, for the last four and a half years, I've been specifically focused on recruiting for startups in the Bay Area. And so my answers are going to tend to focus bias towards that market. Um, If you'd like me to expand and speak more generally, feel feel free to to ask. Sure. And about 60% of our listeners are not in the United States. And when we did another show on interviews a while back, Mm -hmm. there was some discussion of how labor markets are quite different in different countries. So this is really about what it's about. And hope that listeners in other regions find it interesting. Sure. Okay. So to answer your question, why do recruiters exist? First, I should probably clarify that Rocket is a recruiting agency, and in general, there are two types of recruiters. There are internal recruiters who work directly for company X. Uber, for example, has recently built up an internal recruiting team of over 70 recruiters. Uber has also been a client of ours for over a year, so they have an internal recruiting team. They also work with us as a recruiting agency. Most of the companies that we support either have a very small or non-existent internal recruiting team. And so they lack that function as a company. And that's why they turn to us to support their recruiting efforts. Oftentimes, the hiring managers for specific functions within a company will be tasked with recruiting. But at the end of the day, if you're a VP of engineering, you have three or four other priorities that are going to come higher than actually scheduling interviews, vetting candidates, running through the recruiting process. And so the need for recruiters has derived out of someone having to make the whole interviewing, hiring, and recruiting process their number one priority in order to do it effectively. And that's the role that recruiters fill. In the sense that someone whose job is 
to oversee the process of people getting hired into jobs? It's very much a shepherding job, definitely. If you followed this space at all, you may have be aware of a company hired. Yes. Um, originally started as developer auction. Uh, so when they first launched three, four years ago, we watched them very carefully and, and um, a little bit cautiously wondering, are they going to replace recruiters? Because they wanted to take recruiters out of the process entirely and build a marketplace that would connect engineers directly with hiring managers. What they quickly realized less than a year or two into their efforts is that it's not enough to just put those two interested parties together. Someone has to be the captain driving the ship towards a singular goal. And as a recruiter, as an agency recruiter, if your commission, your livelihood depends on making these matches, then you are that, the captain of that ship. Um, same with internal recruiters. Their metrics, their goals to be successful within a company are based upon how many hires they make. And they very quickly come to realize that it's not enough just to put two people in the same room who are interested in the same thing if that's not their profession and that's not their number one priority. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned platforms like Hired, and I know there's a number of similar platforms. Um, my experience with recruiters in the job search process generally is it's a very artisanal crafted, high-touch, hand-holding process. Like you go to the farmer's market and there's this guy who's got some cheese that he made at his farm with the goats that he fed, certain brand of clover, versus if I want mass-produced cheese, I would go to the highly automated, uh, mechanized, the you know very automated supply chain large store. Right. So uh, is there something inherently about the job search that makes it more like the farmer's market more than the supermarket? I think it's that we're, we're dealing with people on every side of the equation. And so it's very difficult to apply science to that. Usually if you're selling something you are selling a software or a product that may have various options, but it's not constantly morphing and changing its mind. And for, for us, what we have on both sides of the equation that we're dealing with is a hiring manager who has a company that's rapidly shifting and the needs of that company are changing. And we have a job seeker whose requirements on what they're looking for are changing as they go through the, the job search process. And so it's not as easy as saying at the beginning, the client says, I need five years of experience with Ruby on Rails. And the job seeker says, I have five years experience with Ruby on Rails and I want this salary or this type of work environment or this type of position, whatever is important to them. And putting the two together and saying, you both want the same thing, let's, let's sign on the dotted line. Because as those discussions happen over the course of, of weeks, each side learns a little bit more, not just about each other, but also about other factors that are affecting the decision. So for an internal company, they have other candidates and they have to weigh this candidate versus the other candidate. Perhaps they just hired someone who has more or less experience and now changes what future openings are going to look sure. like. And for the job seeker, when they started the process, they thought they wanted one thing, but as they started to realize what opportunities are actually available to them or how many opportunities there are, you can become pickier and choosier or maybe less picky with what your original requirements are. And that's constantly shifting. And so that's a challenge to keep track of both of those and make sure both interests are still aligned at the end of the process as they were at the beginning of the process. Yeah. Okay. So um, you were talking about um, the companies looking for five years of Ruby on Rails experience. Could you tell me a little bit, how do these job descriptions get developed? And is there a lot of back and forth between you and the hiring manager about what the job description looks like? Yeah, I know this is really frustrating for job seekers, but 
job descriptions we don't put a lot of weight in uh, when when we're conducting searches. So I'll tell you about our experience here at Rocket. When when we start working with a new company and they tell us they're looking to hire, the first thing that we do is we set up a meeting at their office to meet with either the founders or the head of engineering and ask a lot of questions. We essentially build a job description for ourselves. If they have one posted online, we'll use that as a starting place. But for whatever reason, job descriptions haven't evolved in about 20 or so years. And 20 years ago, job descriptions were built to keep people away, to, to keep people from applying, unless you meet above this certain bar of expectations, because it wasn't the candidate short market that it is today. And now that the tables have turned, job descriptions haven't adapted. And so what we find is that a job description will say five plus years of Ruby on Rails. But when we go and talk to the hiring manager, they say, our ideal person is X, five plus years of Ruby on Rails, plus all of this other experience. But if you find someone who shows a lot of ambition and a lot of drive and you know has worked on a lot of side projects, and it's okay if they've worked with Python and not Ruby on Rails. We'll hire that person as well tomorrow. And so that's our job when we go into that meeting is to flush out what are the actual requirements. And so we build our own mental map of a job description in that meeting. And as I mentioned, that mental map continues to shift over the course of the months or years that we work with those companies as well as to what's an ideal or acceptable hire look like for that company. And because of that reason, we actually try to refrain from sending job descriptions when we're talking about an opportunity with, with a candidate, because candidates will often see that and rule themselves out because they don't meet this ridiculous bar that was put on the job description that's meant to keep people away. I see. So I've, I've had this experience where I see job description, there's 10 bullet points. And look, I'd say, honestly, there's five of those I have a skill in. So probably not qualified because they're going to hire somebody with nine or 10. And the curse is not actually the five you have are the more uh, important ones. And the five you don't have, well, those are the more flexible ones. Yeah. And so the recruiters actually convinced me to apply for a job that I would have just, eh, nah, I'm not qualified. And, and I'm guessing you you were able to turn that into an interview in most of those cases. Um, it's happened a bunch of times, and certainly sometimes it does work out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a great example. Like I said, I mean, it's very rare that we see a job description that gets us excited enough to want to use that as additional material to the information we're already providing to people to, to get them engaged with talking to the company. So, yeah. so when you that, that maybe goes back, sorry mm -hmm. to cut you off, but just to go back a little bit to the point of what is the role of a recruiter, why yes. do they exist? You know, it's, it's our job to get people engaged who might otherwise not be engaged with a company because they see a job description and they self-select out or they don't see that it's a dog-friendly office because that's not posted online. But when we, but we've been there and we saw dogs running all around. And now when I'm talking to you and you're telling me the most important criteria for me is that I can bring my dog to work every day, I can give you that piece of information and I can try to make this match happen where I otherwise might have not. Okay. So this project you're talking about involves you need to understand a lot about what the company's looking for, and um, they may be looking for a programmer with five years Ruby on Rails. Now I know there are. People in the recruiting field who have an engineering background, many people do not. How do you understand these very nuanced technical job descriptions? Uh, and I don't know what your background is, but say if you were a recruiter who's coming from, say, a psychology background, and mm -hmm. do you know that Solaris and FreeBSD and Linux are actually really similar? And for some jobs, uh, any of those would be adequate, but maybe there's some other jobs where it has to be FreeBSD or right. how, how do you uh, really grasp these technical job descriptions and match them up with technical candidates? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's certainly a, a challenge. Um, my background, I'm a sociology major and fell into recruiting in Japan. 
and I spent countless hours on Wikipedia during my first couple years, um, looking up every acronym that was on a resume that I, I hadn't heard before, and then transitioning that to having conversations with all of the people I'm speaking to and relying on their expertise and their knowledge to, to educate me. Um, a good recruiter will be exceptional at, at asking questions that surface the type of information that you mentioned. You're looking for Ruby on Rails, but there's a lot of companies looking for Ruby on Rails. It's extremely competitive. Are there some similar technologies that if we find someone with that experience, do you have the team in place to mentor or the time to allow them to ramp up? Some recruiters don't ask those questions, so they miss out on a lot of opportunity. Um, but you have to you have to just continue asking those questions. You know, one other thing we do here at Rocket is we we actually invite um, engineers that we're working with or at the clients that we work with in on a regular basis to ask them these sorts of questions as well. Hey, we're seeing you know we invite a big data engineer in and say hey, we're seeing a lot of demand for Hadoop. If someone has, what are some other technologies someone could have worked with? that would indicate that they would also know Hadoop or be able to pick it up very quickly. So it's a great question. I think the, the final point I'll say on that is that um, finding recruiters who specialize in a relatively niche market will mean that they're going to know this type of information and these questions to ask at a much deeper level. So generally, you won't find a generalist recruiter who's able to make those sort of implicit connections. I've been on the other side of this where I'm in the company that's trying to hire, working with a recruiter, and they'll send us a series of candidates who are maybe people are doing very well in their career and good at what they do, but they're just not the right fit. So what, yeah. why does that happen? What's going on there? Um, you know, my guess without knowing much about the situation, would be that the recruiters are probably relying on a job description. And the job description has a list of a lot of terminology as to what you want from this role. And the recruiter doesn't necessarily know what which of those skill sets is a priority. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned in your last example, the recruiter told you, hey, the five that you have are actually the most important. If you don't know that as a recruiter and you just go search all of those terms indiscriminately, you're unlikely to come up with a person who's actually going to match what the role is, even though they might match a lot of the keywords. And I think that's a lot of the negative associations with recruiters is that they search based on keywords rather than understanding for the company like what the role actually is going to require someone to do or for the candidate what that person has actually accomplished in their career if they don't necessarily have these really obvious keywords on their, their profile. So you might, have, you might have answered this question now um, already, but I, I, get, uh, so I get contacted by recruiters, very, probably everyone in the San Francisco area does. And it's not unusual I'll get an email from a recruiter of, like, hey, I have this great job as an Oracle DBA. Send me your resume and your salary requirements. Nowhere on my uh, LinkedIn profile, or I'm not sure what they know about me, but nowhere does it say Oracle DBA or PHP programmer or whatever. And yeah. I wonder, um, well, why did they even think that was a good thing, that I was a good person to approach for this? Or, so yeah. what's, what's going on when that happens? My guess is that there was some random other term on the job description for Oracle DBA that did match the, your profile as well, and so it pulled you into their search. As embarrassing as it is, you know, I get emails and emails trying to recruit me to be a big data engineer. Um, and, you know, it makes me cringe every time I, I see it because these are... This, this is what gives recruiting the reputation that it has. And, you know, recruiting was a very different profession 10 years ago before LinkedIn and the internet really turned it into this opportunity to, hey, if I send out a million messages and 0.1% responds, 
I can make a decent living um, is, is what it's gone, kind of the track that it's taken over the last 10 years. And I think that's starting to shift a little bit. But, you know, before that, you can imagine recruiters had files and drawers and pieces of paper in their office, and they were filled with notes on people's experience and their interests and their phone numbers. And these were only got through referrals and personal networks. And so all of a sudden, when all of this information was available, it completely changed the industry and people realized, hey, what took a long, long time and a lot of hard work and so was rewarded appropriately previously, now I can do, you know, one one hundredth of that amount of work and still get the same rewards and I don't see any repercussions to sending out these million in-mails. Um, so it happened very quickly that the recruiting industry went through this like mass spamming phase, which was obviously in large part due to LinkedIn and making everyone's uh, professional information available to all. Cody, so we've been talking about job description and requirements and job fit. Got all that down. How do you go about locating candidates who might be qualified? Yep, so the first thing that we do after I mentioned meeting with the client, really sussing out what they're actually looking for, the first thing we do as a recruiting agency is to go to our internal network. So everyone here will reach out to people that they've been in touch with previously and already had these conversations around what is it you're looking for and we've identified a match with this new opportunity. And I should say you have a staff of people, I'm looking through this window here, there's a number of, and are all these people recruiters? Everyone you see is a recruiter. We run a lean operations team, so we're about 25 recruiters yeah. and one office manager. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's a lot of internal networks yeah, yeah. to start with. The second thing we'll do from there is we will take to both our database, which we've built over the course of five years or so, and, and taken notes about the types of people that we think will be a good match for these new opportunities. Um, and then we'll take to the, the World Wide Web. And, of course, LinkedIn is a tool that we use um, for software engineering. There's a lot of other great tools that are out there. We can do both Boolean x-ray searches or searches directly on sites like GitHub and Stack Overflow. If we're looking for designers. There's Behance and Dribble, etc., there's a lot of recruiting tools that have come out in the last year or so as well that make it easier to find people's direct contact information. So engineers may have noticed that they're getting more emails to their personal emails or even phone calls. Um, there's a company called Connectifier that was just acquired by LinkedIn uh, about a week or two ago, and they were great for identifying people's personal contact information that may be displayed somewhere on the web even if it's not associated to one of those profiles. And then we'll go about uh, trying to, to get in touch and, and set up either a call or a coffee conversation. The other thing that we're fortunate to be able to do here at Rocket, because we have located our office in Soma, is to get out in the real world as well. So um, we have hosted meetups for meetup groups like the um, SF Bay Piggies Python group for various uh, test and automation groups. We've sponsored happy hours for the SF Ruby group. Um, so taking advantage of the fact that we're here in this great location and so to be able to meet people in person as well. So a variety of channels. Variety of channels. Okay. Now from a job seeker perspective, somebody who's looking for a job or open opportunities, what um, do job seekers do to either stand out and make themselves an attractive candidate or, or to um, maybe disqualify themselves or raise raise some warning flags. Ooh. You can take those one at a time if you yeah. want. So let's start with some warning signs. If your resume lists every technology you've ever heard of, that's a warning sign. Um, some people are in the habit of making this huge skills list at the top of their resume. And the feedback we get from, from clients, so I'm, I think would be helpful for your users is that, uh, sorry, your listeners, is that any 
technology terminology that's on your resume is fair game to be probed into and during an interview. And if you're unable to answer questions about that technology, then it leads the interviewer to the assumption that you are as unknowledgeable about all of the other terms on your resume. So my advice would be to only put skill sets on your resume that you feel comfortable answering questions in depth or very clearly state these are the technologies that I'm an expert with and these are the technologies that I'm a beginner with. That would be one. Um, this one kind of bothers. I, I don't like that it is a, a prejudice, but it is. Um, if you put on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile that you were actively looking for a job, it's kind of a yellow flag to companies because it's such a job you know, candidate short market, um, and, and most candidates have a lot of opportunities, they wonder why is this person so actively looking for a job. Again, I personally don't don't believe in that thought process, but I've certainly heard that from, from clients. In order to stand out, I don't think um, my advice is, is um, amazing, but, you know, if you have side projects, list your side projects. If you've won awards at work, show your awards. If you've been promoted, um, you know, show on your your profile that you've you've been promoted and you've risen through the ranks. That you've taken on more responsibility. I guess as a recruiter, one of the things that that is helpful and we respect is someone who is conscientious about their job search and they know which companies they have already spoken to and which companies they haven't. Um, if someone is very relaxed about, sure, just send my resume wherever you want, um, that's a warning sign to me because it, it just makes me think that you're not taking the process very seriously right at the beginning stage. And so are you going to take it seriously when it comes time to interview? And you have to. Um, even though companies are desperate to hire people, they're not desperate to hire just anybody. And I think that's what can be frustrating for job seekers in this market, is you read articles and you hear about the talent shortage that exists, but it is difficult to find a job. And it's because companies are still very particular about the type of people that they want to hire, and that's part of the reason that the job, that the this candidate shortage, quote unquote, exists. You mentioned resume. Now, I did a job search about a year ago and yeah. I made it through and I have a uh, job now without ever having a resume. And I told people my LinkedIn profile is pretty much up to date or I kept it up to date. Is that sufficient? Yeah. And most people say, yeah, it's fine. Do you think the resume, you said the job descriptions are a, haven't changed in 10 years. What's the status of the resume? And is that equally as important now as it's ever been? Um, that's a great question. When I say resume, I guess at this point, I almost use that pretty interchangeably with LinkedIn profile. I would say more than half of the engineers that we represent don't have a formal resume. They use their LinkedIn profile as a resume, which is fine. The one comment I would make to that is that when you make a resume, it's inherently fairly detailed and descriptive about your career history and the projects that you've worked in. Some people mimic that in their LinkedIn profiles. Some people don't. It's very easy to make a bare bones LinkedIn profile that just lists your company and your position. Um, and I think if you're serious about your job search, that's not the best approach because what it means is that during the, the interview process, you're going to have to discuss a lot of very basic information to get to the meaty, interesting stuff that you've actually worked on. So the first questions are going to be, okay, I see you're a software engineer at company X. Tell me about what did you do? And you're going to have to essentially go through and do what you would have done on a resume. Whereas if you've already got that bullet pointed out, 
you allow the conversation to immediately jump into, wow, I see you built out a logging and monitoring system that handled 50 billion requests each week. That sounds really great. Can you tell me what tools you used to design that and what did you learn from that project? In my opinion, that's a much more fruitful discussion. And so I think that creating a detailed profile, let's call it, whether it's a resume or on LinkedIn, still does add value and, and benefit you through the interview process. So you've got um, a bunch of candidates and job description. We talked about who who stands out, who gets the interview. Yeah. So people come in for the interview. Um, what are some things that uh, help people advance to the next round? And what are some things that uh, will cause them not to advance in the process? Yeah, going into an interview is extremely important to be prepared. And I think the mistake that a lot of people make is assuming my skill set is very much in demand and it was very easy for me to get this interview set up. I didn't even have to create a resume or update my LinkedIn profile. And so I'm just going to go in there and tell them about what I've been doing. And as I mentioned previously, interviews are a difficult, rigorous process. And part of the difficulty is if you're an experienced engineer, let's say you've got five to 10 years of experience in engineering, you're being asked to talk about that, essentially all of it, in 30 minutes to an hour. And so obviously you have to edit, edit, edit drastically what information you're actually speaking about. And if you haven't prepared by looking at what the company does in detail, looking at their careers page to see at least what technology stack they use, looking at the LinkedIn profiles of the people who are currently working there to see what patterns you can recognize in the people that they've hired or get more clues about some of the specific projects that they're working on, then you're not going to know how to best position yourself as a good fit for the team. You're going to be wildly guessing which of your thousands of projects that you've worked on during those 10 years you should talk to this interviewer about. And so it's really common and unfortunately frustrating that we get feedback from a client saying, hey, we really liked this engineer, but we didn't see their depth of expertise with building scalable systems. And we talk to the engineer and say, sorry, this was the feedback. And the engineer says, oh, I'm doing that right now. They just didn't ask me about mm. that. And so, you know, because of this time crunch, the more that you can really be prepared and focused and have reviewed five to 10 key projects that you think are going to be interesting and relevant for what the company needs, then there's a small chance that you're going to end up talking about those specific projects during the interview. And you may end up getting rejected just because there wasn't a discussion much. Sure. And it is a two-sided market and the company, certainly they need to do a good job on the interview in order to uh, close on the candidates they want. What are some things you see in the more successful companies that are able to close that makes their interview process work? Yeah, good question. Here with Silicon Valley startups, um, there's been a big focus on from the CEO and founder on down making recruiting a priority and the companies that are most effective at hiring really take that to heart and so the, the engineers as they're interviewing they get to talk to the founders, they talk to the heads of engineering, they come in and they meet with the team, maybe they go for a lunch or a dinner, they get to really feel like they're part of the team and the environment before they make the decision whether to work there or not. So it's a, it's a very hands-on and flexible process. And the other thing that startups in particular are doing is, is trying to make that a very efficient process. So Google is notoriously long and drawn out for their interview process. And if a startup is also going to have a hiring committee and three, four rounds of on-sites, you know, that's going to give the candidate the impression that 
this is how they make all of their decisions as a company. And that's not going to lead a startup to be successful. And so be able to be fast and efficient with making decisions, being able to be flexible and creative with your interview process and the perks or benefits that you can offer to an individual and making people feel that personal touch and really part of the team. Those are some of the core ethos of what a startup is about. And if you can implement those through your interview process as well, then you're gonna have the highest success rate in hiring. So you partially answered this. Uh, if you wanna expand, what are things that hiring companies do wrong that cause them to lose out on people through the interview process? Sure. Or through any phase of the hiring process? Slow response times, definitely. We actually did a survey about two years ago. We sent the survey out and got responses from over 100 Bay Area software engineers. And we asked them um, what are their expectations for hearing back from a company. And 83% said that they expected to hear back after every step within 48 hours. And that makes sense because if you start thinking about you've been through a job search, anyone who's been through a job search, I've been through a couple, start to think back about when you came out of an interview and you were really excited and you thought it was great and then 48 hours later you haven't heard back, you start to mentally let yourself down and you start to come up with reasons why that might not have been the best opportunity anyways. Um, because you don't want to be broken hearted you're assuming at that point that the answer is going to be no. And so you start to talk yourself out of the opportunity. And so if a company does get back after a week, at that point, you know, a lot of engineers may have already mentally moved on and started to put all of that energy and excitement into a new company. And if that's reciprocated, then they're going to go and join that company because of the energy and the momentum that they created with the process. So being slow is, is really one of the biggest mistakes that startups can make. The other thing, being inflexible with your process. So if you require a 30-minute FizzBuzz coding challenge for every single person before they even get to have a conversation with someone at your company, and you're requiring this of experienced software engineers who at another company are getting wined and dined by a VP of engineering for coffee and lunch as a first step, it's going to be hard to compete. Yeah, I did. In my job search, there were companies that wanted me to do um, sometimes three, four, six hour coding challenge where I had to go through this calculation. This may be a great company and a great job, or they may just not like my code, which uh, certainly I've submitted coding challenges and people say we don't like yeah. It's so this calculation, is it worth investing five hours of my time to get possibly zero return yeah. on it? And, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, but it is a cost that I need to take into account. Yeah. We, we asked that question on the survey as well, and that was interesting because the results were somewhat polarizing. About 30% of the people said they think that a, 30% of engineers said they think that a, an online or, or take home challenge is the best way to demonstrate their skills and ability. But then there was close to 50% that said they would not follow through with a process if they had to do that as part of the, the process. So people sit very yeah, much yeah. On, on both sides of the fence. Um, but you're right. We, we, never encourage a company to do that extensive of a four or five, six hour challenge. If they have something like that, we try to recommend that maybe they make the first one to two hours of it something of a take home assignment and then integrate the rest into an on site interview where they say, we're going to ask you to start this. And then come on site and work with some of our engineers and talk about how you've gotten to where you are now and finish that project out as kind of more of like a team project interview rather than being asked to do it all on your own. So we try to counsel companies to, to, to be more creative with that because it is very frustrating as a job seeker to be asked to do those types of projects maybe five, six different times from these different companies and then just be told no thanks. Um, it's, yes. Sure. 
Now, we've all uh, been through this process where you go in through job interview and, and the company chooses not to call you back. And especially if you really like the job, it's quite disappointing, but it's also part of the job search. And I always hope that I could learn from uh, whatever experience I have and learn from failure. It can be somewhere between difficult or impossible to get any feedback from companies about, okay, well, we didn't like you because this and this, uh, or to get information that's really honest. Yeah. Is, my experience, uh, not, is my experience unusual in the difficulty of getting, getting feedback about the reason for failure? Um, unfortunately, your experience is, is pretty common. My advice, the, the best chance you have of getting feedback is actually if you've worked with a recruiting agency um, because oftentimes we are able to get more concrete feedback from the company as to why they didn't move forward. Generally, they don't want to send it via email, um, but we're able to get on the phone with them and say, hey, you know, you need to tell us why this didn't work out. And they have a motivation to do that because if they can give us more specific information about what type of people are not a fit, then we're going to do a better job of filtering and introducing the best people. And so when we position it that way, we're oftentimes able to get more detailed feedback than the company would share directly with a job applicant. But companies, as part of their policy, for better or worse, they don't they don't want to do two things. One, they don't want to open themselves up to having the, the engineer get competitive back and forth and saying, actually, I am good at that yeah. and, and create a long dialogue because they can't afford to do that with every single job applicant. And to some sort of HR legal issue, the less that they share, the less they put themselves at risk. Um, and that's why, again, most of our feedback has gotten by phone. It was interesting to me that you said that because I've uh, certainly had recruiters tell me stuff that the company wouldn't tell me. And I assume it goes both ways because they'll ask me, what did you think? And if I didn't like it, didn't like the company or the job, and I'll tell the recruiter why and I don't have any expectation that the company will not receive that information. Mm -hmm. So it looked to me like one of the things recruiters do is they act as this back channel with plausible deniability in mm -hmm. both directions. So no one has to speak face to face <laughs> to anyone. Right. Especially when it comes to such a stressful um, action as, as changing jobs. Yeah. I think that's true. Okay, so one thing I wanted to cover here is the issue of compensation. Mm -hmm. So how are recruiters compensated? Like who's, who's paying for the recruiter? Sure. So internal recruiters, I think that's that's clear. The company pays internal. So they're employees. They have they're, a salary. And they're bonuses employees. And they have a salary. Generally, they have bonus that's performance based, but not tied to a specific number of hires, because companies don't want to incentivize their internal recruiters to make matches that maybe aren't the right match. Agency recruiters work primarily on commission and those fees are paid by the company. So I mentioned Uber earlier, we're recruiting for Uber. Uber hires a software engineer that we've introduced. We have a contract with them that they pay us a certain percentage of that person's first year annual salary. So candidates then look at the recruiter as they would any employee or representative of the company that they're dealing with, which no. I would say maybe I, I don't look at recruiters that yeah. way. But uh, I mean, internal recruiter, again, I'll, I'll speak yeah. about agency recruiters. Yeah. Um, we're not employees of the company. And um, as I mentioned, you know, our number one goal is to make sure that you – as a job seeker, find the opportunity that you're most excited about and, and that you take that opportunity. And if you, Robert, were looking for a job next week and you were working with Rocket Recruiting, I'd talk to you about what you're looking for. And if we have three or four or five different companies that all seem to match that, I'd suggest why don't we go through the process with these handful of companies and um, 
I would do my best to make sure that we keep all of these interviews happening on par so that you're not forced into making a decision before you've gotten to finish out your other processes. And that ideal scenario is we get to the end and you've got two, maybe three offers that you can compare and you can make the best choice for you. Um, so I guess in this market, I would say agency recruiters, if, if they're smart, are focusing more on delivering a great experience to the engineers who are looking for jobs and more as your agent than they would be a part of the company itself. And do you, I, I've heard it said, and this may be not so true in a market like this, but that companies are better at negotiating salary because they're constantly hiring people, whereas a job seeker, you only do it every two or five years. Do you, do you think job seekers do a good job negotiating salary, or do you think they leave, leave a lot of money on the table? Um, I think the majority of job seekers, software engineers in Silicon Valley right now are getting very fair offers. Um, and part of that is because if you are going through a few processes and you get a couple offers, then you know, you're going to be able to assess what is the market determined that I'm worth right now. And companies are not in a position to try to undercut you. They're spending and investing so much time to get someone through the process that when they decide they want someone, they're going to pay that person, for the most part, what they think is fair and also going to make that person happy. And they know that if they try to shortchange you by $20,000, you're going to get an email next week from someone saying, hey, we'll pay you X to come yeah. and work here. And, and so it's not going to be a, a long-lasting relationship. So I don't think that many job seekers are, are in, in Silicon Valley and engineers in particular are leaving a lot of money on the table right now. And so doing what you do and you've been in the field for a number of years, you must have seen uh, somebody, people take a job and then a few years down the road, you have a relationship with that person and now they're looking for another job. Do you think uh, people make pretty good decisions and end up being happy with their jobs? Or uh, do you see a lot of people getting into a job and, and then they realize, hmm, this isn't at all what I thought I was hired for. Or the company culture is quite different. And yeah. then they're just unhappy until they make, yeah. you know. So I'll give you one stat that will be somewhat helpful in that. So we have, when someone starts a job that we've introduced them to, in our contract, we have a 90-day guarantee period with the company that, hey, this person, if they don't stay at least 90 days, will have to give some sort of refund or a full refund. Um, we have less than 5% of people leave or get fired within that 90-day period. Um, so that's a pretty small, pretty small percentage, especially in a volatile market like like the startup market here in Silicon Valley. The thing is that startups are very volatile, and so people change their jobs often here, but it, I, it doesn't, from what I can tell, doesn't necessarily mean that they're disgruntled or feel like they made a bad decision, but so many things about the company that they joined will change over the course of a year or two that it, where it is a year or two later just might not be the place that it was when they first joined. And so there are plenty of opportunities for you to go ahead and, and move on. And so if you're not happy with something and you have a number of opportunities available to you, then it's, it's uh, you know, reasonable to, to take a new position. And looking at that same question from the other side, and maybe you partially answered that with the point about five uh, percent but are companies pretty happy with the people they hire or do you see a lot of companies that realize they made a mistake uh, and they're not so happy with it with a hire companies the current mentality of companies that are hiring is that they're more scared of hiring someone who is going to be the wrong fit than they are about missing out on someone who could have been the right fit. 
And so most companies, if they have some hint of doubt or they're not quite sure that this is going to be a great match, they'll tend to, to pass and keep looking for someone who they feel very confident about. And, and yeah, going back to the less than 5%, um, you know, I think companies are, are trying to be as, as sure as they can when they make the decision to hire. And so it's not often where they just throw up their hands and say, oh man, we really screwed up on that one. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners on any of these themes that we've been discussing? Sure. There's one, there's one topic that's uh, kind of fresh in mind for me because um, both my brother and my cousin were just recently changing jobs and um, I talk them through job search strategy a little bit and, and both of them are in sales and so I thought they may be a little bit more intuitive about how should I go about uh, finding this next job opportunity for me. Um, and, and just realize that there's some common misconceptions that I'm very aware of, but maybe not everybody is. Um, so the first thing you know, that I, I think is, is important for, for everybody here is that if I'm going to apply for a job and I know exactly what company I want to apply to, the last thing I'm going to do is apply through their company website online. That is my absolute lowest priority. Um, to explain my, my rationale a little bit there, um, internal recruiters at these companies are the ones generally reviewing these resumes. They're spending their days in meetings with hiring managers. They are arranging interviews. They're receiving resumes from recruiters. They're getting referrals from internal employees. At the end of the day, then they come and they see an inbox with 100 applicants from online. And one of those resumes is yours. And because the ratio of great applicants is so low from that source, they tend to either never look at that daunting and ever-growing list or to look so quickly that your resume would have to say Stanford CS degree, Google, you know, you, you get the idea. In order to actually stand out, there's a lot of quotes online about the average recruiter reads a resume in six seconds or seven seconds. Those ones... Well, I always said 10 or 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's getting shorter and shorter as, as uh, attention spans yeah. decline. But... Um, those resumes get maybe a third of that time and attention because 90% of them are totally off, off the mark. And so if you know exactly what company you want to work for, and, and this is what I just counseled my brother and, and cousin through, the first thing I would do is do a search through their employees on LinkedIn and look for people who are likely going to be in the department you want to work for or even better hiring managers and then look for those people that you have some sort of connection with. Maybe it's a, an alumni from the school that you went to, maybe you worked at a past company together, maybe it's as simple as a shared interest and send that person an email or a uh, LinkedIn message and Tell them that you're really interested in what their company is doing and you'd love to have a quick conversation to learn more about it. The benefit of that is that most companies these days are paying their employees referral bonuses for referring companies. So if you go through that method, they'd be happy to refer you internally to their company, which means that the internal recruiter is going to treat you with priority status because you've been referred by one of their leaders or hiring managers or internal employees. Um, plus, you're going to have that instant connection with the hiring manager already. That's if you know what company you want to work for. Um, a lot of people don't know specifically what company they want to work for, but they know they want X. They're going to, to optimize for X in their next opportunity, whether it's a dog-friendly office or, you know, whether it's the type of position or technology or compensation. Um, 
If that's the case, then I would suggest two things. The first is writing a very clear and succinct message about what you are looking for and sending that to your network and asking, does anybody know of an opportunity like this that they could introduce me to? Same deal, you wanna be referred in by a high priority status channel. The second would be talking to a recruiter that's specialized in that market. And if I'm a job seeker, I'd, I'd talk to an agency recruiter over an internal recruiter because you want to use the most efficient, make the most efficient use of your time. So if you talk, Robert, if you talked to me and told me this is what you'd like to optimize for in your job search, I have the benefit of saying that my team has visited over a hundred different startups here in the Bay Area, and I can whittle down that list to five that are going to be a targeted match for you. If you talk to an intern, that conversation takes half an hour. We start the interview process with these five companies. If you talk to an internal recruiter, you still have to have that 30 minute conversation, but you have no idea of knowing until you've already engaged in that conversation whether or not they're going to be able to offer you what you're optimizing for. And if the answer is no, then you're starting over from square one and you have to do the whole arranging a call and setting up an interview process again. Okay. Hope that's helpful. Yes, uh, very helpful. Now, if our listeners would like to learn more about rocket recruiting, how can they find out? Um, our website is www.rockit, rocket, it's a IT pun, rocketrecruiting.com. Um, you can email myself personally, Cody, C-O-D-Y, at rocketrecruiting.com. Okay, and we'll put that all in the show notes. Okay, great. Or our general website is Mission Control at Rocket Recruiting. Okay. And do you personally blog or have Twitter or any conference talks or any other things people could follow you? Yeah. Um, I've published a few blogs, both on Medium and LinkedIn. I recently spoke at the F50 Founders World Conference. Um, nothing upcoming at the moment. I have a Twitter profile as well, Kodiak, C-O-D-I-A-K. We'll put that in the show notes too. Okay. Cody Volunteer, thank you very much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks, Robert. It was great. Great being here. We love to hear from the listeners. You can email us at team at sc-radio.net, message us on Twitter at SC Radio, or find our group on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Google+. For Software Engineering Radio, this has been Robert Blumen. Thanks for listening to this episode of SE Radio. This is the first episode featuring an ad by a paid sponsor, and we wanted to let you know why. The show was founded in 2006 by a group of volunteers who dedicated an incredible effort to launch it and covered all the operating expenses from their own pockets. In 2012, IEEE Software Magazine took over production and management. The IEEE Computer Society is a U.S. registered nonprofit organization, and all the show hosts and guests donate their time free of charge. We will always provide our listening audience with free access, but there are real costs associated with producing the show, and after a lot of discussion, we decided that paid ads offered the best option for covering those production and distribution expenses. The revenue we generate will allow us to continue to provide great content and to grow the show over time. If you have any comments or concerns about this change, you can write to the show editor, Robert Blumen, via the email team at se-radio.net. We appreciate your continued support. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support.